prepare to bow the eyes and close. Speak to our hearts now, Lord Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit flood this place so that whatever is said and done will be in accordance with the will of the Lord. We have come to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, as I said, we will, we will explore together the letter to the church at Ephesus. You remember how John ended up on the Isle of Patmos, right? He was thrown because of his faithfulness he was preaching the gospel into a pot of boiling oil. And when he survived, they, they banished him to the Isle of Patmos. Now, I don't know what he looks like being burnt in oil or how it may have affected his health. Have you thought about that? Yes. But he survived, praise God. Amen. Amen. And so from the Isle of Patmos, Jesus appears to John and gives him a vision of how the world and things of the world would end. And from this we get the book of Revelation. This also includes the spiritual state of the church during this time period. The churches were located in ancient Turkey. There were seven churches to which the letters were sent. The number seven means complete or perfect. And we see the number seven, the first time we see the number seven is in the book of Genesis at the creation of the world, for the world was created in seven days. It represents a perfect cycle of time. The seven churches represent a religious history of the church from the first to the second coming of Jesus. While each church shows us what appeared in that specific church during its historical period of time, it is important to understand that today you may find that your church or you may know of a church that has had several of these experiences. So your church may start in fire and then end up like the Laodicean church. In fact, I've been involved in a few churches at, at its beginning, and every church starts in fire. Folks say, oh, we're not going to be like the other church. We're going to be different. We're going to be full of the Holy Ghost. We will do community work. We will, we will work together as a team, and everybody starts on fire. But then along the way, things tend to fizzle out. Now, on a personal level, it seems to me that even individuals go through this same cycle. Sometimes we're hot, sometimes we're not. Come on, talk back to me. Sometimes we're focused on God and on His mission, and other times we're busy fighting each other. Which means that this warning not only goes out to the church, but it also goes out to us as individuals. Ephesus covers the history of history period from AD 30 to AD 100. The stars represent angels who are messengers sent by Jesus through John with a message to the church at Ephesus. It was God's desire to save his people. It is still God's desire to save his people. Amen. In fact, the word of God says that I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all, God wants to see all saved. Amen. Amen. Just like he used John back then, he wants to use us to fulfill his purpose. 
But it's also important to know the history and the religious situation on the ground at the time that these letters were sent out. So in Ephesus, we see that Ephesus had an issue with idolatry. Ephesus was a pagan city filled with idols and temples to each god. In the midst of, pagan, of this pagan city was a temple that was so big and so famous that it became one of the seven wonders of the world. Ephesus was a thriving city uh, that attracted people from all over the world. They came not only to do business, but they came to worship the god Artemis, which was the goddess of fertility. And yet in Ephesus, strangely enough, in the midst of all this idol worship, in Ephesus was a Christian church called the Church at Ephesus. The temple became the treasury. The temple became the treasury from which you could go to borrow money or you could go to bank your money. Interestingly enough, even in Jerusalem, the temple at Jerusalem also became the treasury. Remember when Jesus came and the whip to run folks out? Because they had they abused, and instead of keeping the, the treasury part in a certain area, they had brought it all the way into the temple where they worshipped. And so the temple to Artemis, in the temple to Artemis, we are told that there were hundreds of male and female prostitutes in the temples. Let me repeat it just in case you didn't get it. In the temple to Artemis, there were male, hundreds of male and female prostitutes. And these prostitutes were all a part of the religious services. Just use your imagination. <laughs> but there was also the worship of Demetrius. He was an emperor and he built a 50 feet tall statue to himself and demanded that the people worship him. His statue he built on top of other gods. The gods were holding him up as if to suggest that he was the God of all gods. This was a frightening sight for Christians because next to Nero, who persecuted the Christians like no one else, was Demetria. And as Christians, you will understand that if you refuse to worship this God, worship these gods worship this emperor that you were not able to do business with others. But more than that, you were persecuted for taking a stand against this idolatry. Early emperors challenged Christians by calling themselves God. And they used words to describe themselves such as Savior, Master, Son of Man, Lord, and of course, God. All these were words that were used to describe or names that were used to ascribe to Jesus. So this means that this was an insult to the Christians whenever they used these names. And all around them, the Christians, were temples dedicated to the worship of these emperors. So one of the challenges the Christian faced were, was the worship of idols, but they also faced demon worship. In Ephesus, they practiced cast chanting spells and worshiping demons, and they would whip people up into a frenzy so that they got almost get hypnotized and from that point they could get you to do whatever they wanted you to do. That's why Paul said to the Ephesian brothers, 
put on the whole armor of God. For you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness in high places. Because there were battling folks who, did, who believed in and practiced demon worship. So the worship of emperors and demons were openly practiced by just about everybody except for the Christians. And if you were ambitious and you wanted to become a doctor or a lawyer, if, if you wanted to start your own business, and, or if you wanted to be accepted in society uh, with the aristocratic or the bougie folks, you had to go along to get along. And so did some Christians. They compromised so that they could fit in to society. The city of Eph Ephesus sat on the edge of the sea coast. Uh, ships docked in the port, bringing and taking products in and out of Ephesus. It was a city booming with trade and business, and historians say that Ephesus was a modern city like New York or Paris or London, and I would add Houston because of the seaport. So it was modern, it was rich, it was diverse, it attracted people from different cultures, from different ethnic backgrounds and religious backgrounds as well. So to ensure that the people worship them, the emperors built statues to themselves and place them outside of the mall and the shopping plaza. So before you could enter the mall, you were required to stop and to worship these emperors. They would have stems of incense and you would take the stem and dip it in the stuff and you bow, the quick bow, and then you went about your business. It was simple, it was quick. It was easy, but it was profound, a profound act of worship that was required for you to compromise your Christian beliefs if you wanted to be accepted in these circles, if you wanted to go to the mall. Imagine having to go to the mall today, right? And before you go enter, you had to bow and worship one of these gods or emperors. And if you didn't do so, then you were not allowed to enter into the mall. I wonder, what are some of the things that you're bowing to today? What are some of the things that we're compromising our religious principles in order to, to be a part of? What are some of the things that we're giving into the temptations the requirements in order to, to be accepted into certain certain circles or to be, attend certain schools or to, to, to start certain businesses or to associate with certain individuals. What are some of the things that we are compromising with? We're going along with in order to get along. And so because they started compromising to fit in, Jesus says, I have one thing against you. The last thing I want to hear Jesus say to me is I got something against you. After all the years that I've been serving faithfully in the church, as a deacon, as an elder, as a pastor, a teacher, a health director, whatever it is that you serve as, and still God says, I got something against you. Name Ephesus means desi desirable. And yet, this church is called the loveless church. Jesus identifies this church as being patient, as persevering through the challenges, but Jesus accuses them of forgetting their first love. Like a new believer. Who comes into the church on fire, full of energy, you're ready to volunteer to anything you ask them to deliver. Ready. I'm, I'm, pick me, pick me, pick me. Excited, ready to go. But then along the way, uh, 
that excitement starts fading. That fire starts going dimmer and dimmer. And you lose your zeal. You don't forget about God altogether. He's just not as important as some other stuff. Not as important to serve the Lord as some other stuff. Maybe the job gets in the way and, and you start thinking of your money and the bills you have to pay. And, and you think, if I don't work on Sabbath, I may lose my job. It's not that God isn't important, but the job becomes more important than God. Maybe you don't like the way things are going. Somebody says to you something that, that's hurtful and you decide I'm not going back to that church. Not that you've turned your back on God, but uh, your feelings, your emotions are hurt and they become more important than serving the Lord. Imagine what Jesus went through. What if Jesus had said, I'm not going to put up with the stuff that y'all handing out to me. Maybe you don't like the way church is going. And you don't realize that it's not the pastor or the elders who are running this church, but this is the church of God. Yeah. And no matter who attacks, no matter what folks do, the Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Amen. Maybe because of COVID, uh, it's become more convenient to just stay at home and watch on Facebook while you do some more important things. And slowly, but surely, your love and your passion for God fade away. I know we all know some individuals who used to serve the Lord. They used to be at church. They were very active in all kinds of ministries at this church. But they no longer attend. And the sad truth, you know, I've, I've been on Facebook and seen some folks who used to be in church, were active in church, putting all kinds of stuff on Facebook, saying all kinds of things, using language that they didn't use, and dressing in ways, and partaking of all kinds of beverages that they never used to partake of. They once had a zeal, a passion, a love, a commitment to God, but something got in the way. And it just ebbed away. The Bible says that in the last days, that the love of many shall wax cold. That because iniquity shall abound, the love of men shall wax full. That men shall become lovers of themselves instead of lovers of God. Now this message is interesting because there are some who believe that once saved, always saved. But here Jesus is saying that if you don't listen to me, if you don't repent and return, you will be cast away. Paul says, I got to be careful that I don't get cast away. So the idea that once you've given your life to God that you can't lose your salvation is false. The idea that once you become an Adventist that you just become one of God's special folks and you can't be lost is false. Your relationship with God must be nurtured. It must be nurtured by us spending time with God in prayer, in studying the word of God. But not only that, in sharing the gospel with those around you and spreading God's love to those who are broken and damaged so that they too might know the love of God but also we practice the love of God that we talk about so the love of God becomes stronger and stronger in us. Remember that you never lose your freedom of choice when you become a Christian. But God also had a commendation or a praise for this church. He says, 
You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, just like I do. The in names in Revelation are symbolic of a group of people who reflect a certain lifestyle. The Nicolaitans were very carnal-minded. They believed that the spirit was all that mattered and that the body wasn't important since you only worship God with the spirit. But I don't even believe that. We worship God both with our bodies and with our spirit. They argue that since the body is carnal and that the body will never make it to heaven, that it didn't matter what you did with the body. So they ate foods that were um, dedicated to idols. They shared each other's wives. And they ate a lot. In fact, the word Nicholas means, let's eat now. Let's just eat up and eat, drink, and be merry tomorrow we die. Let's have a feast and let's just party all over and all day long. Not only were they carnal-minded, they were also materialistic. Maybe this church was so strong against the Nicolaitans because Paul came to Ephesus and preached for three and a half years. He would preach every day from, from 11 to 2 p.m. in the marketplace for three and a half years. The church was so powerful because of its stand against false teaching that this church began to influence the pagan worshipers to become part of them. And, 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 and folks started walking away from idolatry and the demon worship. And, and, but this caused the church to be persecuted. But Jesus encouraged them to stand strong. And so he made a promise to them. He said, to him who overcomes. In fact, seven times Jesus says, to him that overcomes. This is a challenge that God gives to each of the church. We are to overcome. We are to overcome selfishness. We are to overcome sin. We are to overcome hatred. We are to overcome division. We are to overcome anything that the, Lord, the devil puts in our way to prevent the church of God from uniting and fulfilling the purpose for which God has called us to do. And we saw on Sunday that when we, when we come together, we can overcome any and every challenge that the devil puts in our way. Because with God, all things are possible. Amen. Greater Amen. is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So I don't care how great it may seem or impossible it may seem or how weak you may seem, you can overcome with God by your side. Amen. Amen. I have a sermon that I preach that says that God can win by many or by few. When Jonathan and, and his armor bearer went up against the Philistines, the whole army of the Philistines, and in fact, uh, he went up the jagged, rough cliff, and his prayer was that if God takes me to the top of the hill, then I know that God is with me and that I can defeat the army. You see, what Jonathan figured, up, figured out, that it would take so much energy and so much of himself to get to the hill, the top of the hill, that if I, if I manage somehow to get there, the only way I could win is if God is on my side. Because I'm so weak and so few that there is, there is no way that just the two of us could defeat an entire army. And God took them up to the hill and they defeated. So God could win by many or by few. So God says, whoever overcomes, I will give you a chance to eat at the tree of life in the midst of the garden. There was a tree of, the, the, the tree of life is mentioned six times in the Bible. Three times it's mentioned in Genesis and three times it's mentioned in Revelation. We lose the tree of life in Genesis, but praise God, we will get it back at the end of time. Amen. 
the perfect world that God created uh, where the tree of life uh, was given to Adam and Eve was taken away when man sinned. This tree was intended to allow man to live forever. Once uh, he ate from this tree and he remained sinless, if we remain faithful to God, we shall once again eat of this tree of life. Amen. But for all the good that was done, although the church never gave in to the pressure around them, yet they were not doing so because they loved the Lord or because they loved God's people. They were doing it out of tradition. And a loveless church is a fake church. Fake religion. You know, it's like when we were in college, you know, I, we just saw, picked it up from each other. You know, it's the folks, the, you can always tell a theologian, you know, just by the way we dressed, we would grab our Bibles, hold it to our chest as if we love Jesus more than everybody else. Really? There goes a the theology. <laughs> as if we were some, something special, more special than others. And so God doesn't want us to follow him out of tradition. The power of Christianity must be rooted in a ridiculous faith or a ridiculous love that loves at times that make no sense. Yet you love because God loved us. Amen. When we were worthless, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah. And so God wants us to follow him into having a love relationship with him. He doesn't want us to follow him on a duty or just because we were raised this way. I've always been an Adventist my whole life. I'm third generation Adventist. I don't know anything else. And so that's why I do. he wants us to follow him because we're madly in love with him. And we just want to show him how much we love him. Remember from where you have fallen. Repent of your sin and return to what you had in the beginning. Number one, remember how God loved you when you were nothing. And when instead of condemning you, he loved you, he forgave you, and he gave us a brand new start. Remember how fascinated you were about the love of God, how excited you were when you fell in love with Jesus. But somewhere along the line, you lost your way. And now even though you're still doing the right thing, you, you lost your passion, lost your interest, lost your excitement for God. You're doing it, but without the passion, without the love. And there's so many Adventists that I see that are vacillating in the valley of decision right now. They're, they're wondering whether or not they should stay in the church. There are folks that are telling me, I don't believe in that stuff anymore. I don't go to church anymore. I don't care. I asked someone to sing. And they told me, I'm not an Adventist anymore. Lost the passion. And today God is calling you to remember and recapture the love that you once had for him. And then he says, repent. Your responsibility is to take action. Acknowledge your sin. Tell God you're sorry and that you want to change and ask him to give you the power of the Holy Spirit to transform your life so that you could be a vessel that he could use. And then third and final, return to the love you once had. God promised that if you return, that he will give you the tree of life. Amen. Artemis was the goddess of fertility and life. And in the out course of the temple to Artemis was a tree that they called the tree of life. 
women would come to this tree if they wanted to get pregnant. And they would rub against the tree, hoping that the tree would bring life out of them. If you were sick and dying and you wanted to be healthy again, you could come, they say, and rub against the tree. And it would bring you life. If you wanted to start a business and, or, and you wanted it to be prosperous and successful, all you had to do is come and touch the tree. And they believed that this tree was a source of life. But of course, the Christians refused to participate in this ritual, even though it seemed to bring success to many. But here, Jesus is saying to the Christians at Ephesus, if you remain faithful, I will grant you an opportunity to eat from the tree of life. Not the tree on earth. Not a tree that perishes after a while. But a tree that will last throughout eternity. Amen. Amen. You will be able to come and live with me in paradise and eat from this tree. Amen. Spend eternity with God. Sit at the feet of Jesus and, and enjoy being in the presence of this God. Amen. The emperors on earth lived in what man called paradise. But most citizens never got a chance to enter into the paradise where the emperor lived, much less live in this paradise. But Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, promises that if we remain still faithful to him, that one day we will be able to dwell with him in paradise. I don't know about you, but I long to go to live with Jesus in paradise where there's no more persecution, no more suffering. I don't have to be ashamed to call myself a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I don't have to deal with death and pain and betrayal and hatred and anger and, and all these deceptions of this world that, that I see all around me. I will be able to see my mother again and live with in eternity in paradise forever. And ever, and ever. Amen. I want to be in that place. Amen. God is calling us to be faithful to him. Amen. To stand for the truth. To don't compromise because everyone else is compromising around you. And you just want to fit in because you're afraid that if you don't fit in that you will stand out. And people will look at you weird and different young folks. Don't be afraid to stand up. Stand out and shine. Amen. Because God has promised that if you're faithful, that He will reward you. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And God is calling somebody back to rekindle that love that you once had with Him. You may be watching on Facebook. Today, God is calling you, He is talking to you. He, has, uh, he is withholding the wrath of destruction on this world so that you might have a chance to be saved. He is still pouring out his grace and mercy, but God's grace will not always strive with men. So the word of God says today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. He's talking to you. He's talking to you. And so, Father, your people have come here today. We have lost our first love. We've turned our backs on you, but today you're calling us to remember, uh, to return, to repent. Hear our cry, O oh Lord, and so our prayer, Lord, because you have a purpose for this church. You have a purpose for our lives, Lord. You can win this community by many or by few, but you're calling us to be faithful to you. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.